And we welcome you to the Bible Speaks Morning Worship Service, whether you're watching us on YouTube or by public access. Welcome, and may God bless you in this next hour and a half. Let's just bow for prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your presence. For, Lord, in your presence we have strength and encouragement and joy. And we thank you, Lord God, for your presence and what you're going to do today as we allow you to control our thoughts and, Father, our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so great to celebrate this 4th of July, and I hope that as you celebrate it, you will be blessed by it. But let's now turn to a, a song that is a blessed song, 804. Let's stand as we sing the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Sing it now. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dew and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. Our God is marching on. Sing it now. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. We can almost hear the trumpet sound. The Lord's return is near. There are still so many people lost. His message they must hear. Father, give us one more moment, one more day, just one more year, while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Praise the Lord. You 
may be seated. We're going to have a special presentation. Then we'll go and stand for the choruses. But you may be seated. He is Bob Banfield, and he's going to give a special 4th of July explanation of the flags. And Bob, I'll leave it up to you. The history of our nation can be told by flags. The first flag that this nation ever had, was ever used, was to call the Grand Union flag. Grand Union flag, sometimes called the first Navy ensign, and the Cambridge flag. The reason why it was called Cambridge, because General Washington used this flag at his headquarters in Cambridge, Mass. And this was in about 1775, along in that area. And it was used during the American Revolution at the beginning. Our second flag tells about how this nation decided to have its own color, own flag and be separated from the mother country. The first stars and stripes, which is better known as the Betsy Ross flag. The stars and stripes whose birthday we observe on June 14th was created on that day in 1777 when the Continental Congress resolved that the flag of the 13 United States be 13 st stripes alternating red and white, and that the Union be 13 stars, white in a blue field, representing a new constellation. The first army flag had the stars arranged in a circle, presumably based on the idea that no colony should take precedence. The first Navy stars and stripes flung a man of war when she sailed from Boston on June, July 25th, 1818, had the stars arranged in staggering formation in alternate lines in rows of three and twos on a field of blue. However, on September 9th, 1818, the Board of Navy Commissioners received a directive from President Monroe that the flag of the United States shall conform to the padding herewith transmitted by Vix. 20 stars in a blue union, and 13 stripes red and white, according to the Act of Congress. Our, second flag, our third flag tells a lot of history. The, the 15 stars and stripes, better known as the Star Spangled Banner flag, following an Act of Congress on January 13, 1794, this was the flag of our country from 1795 until 1818. The addition of two stars and two stripes came with the emissions of Vermont, March 4th, 1791, and Kentucky, June 1st, 1792, into the Union. This type of flag figured in many stirring episodes. It inspired Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner. It was the first flag to be hoisted over a fortress of the old world when Lieutenant Presley N. O'Banner of the Marine Corps and the midshipman man of the Navy raced it above the Tripolian stronghold in Dern, Tripoli on April 27, 1805. And it was our, was our ensign in the Battle of Lake Erie and was flown by General Jackson at New Orleans. Featuring that, too many stripes would spoil the true design of the flag. Congress passed a law on April 4th, 1818, returning the flag to its original design of 13 stripes and providing a new star to be added to the field as additional states came into the Union. Then for nearly a quarter of a century, this flag was 15 stars and stripes was the banner of our growing nation.
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to read something that I ran across last night. A couple essays that were done by fifth graders. Oh yeah, here we are. The American flag means to me my home, my parents, my relatives, and a lot more. The flag means freedom for you and me, being able to do what we want as long as it doesn't hurt others, and being able to live where we want. In America, you have the choice to write, to vote for any candidate you want. And any person, rich or poor, can run for office for which they are qualified. The second essay was written by another fifth grader. It says, F stands for freedom on land and on sea, for America is the land for me. L stands for liberty, for love, and for care. Look at America. You'll find it there. A stands for achievement. America, too. America's America achievement is the best thing for you. G stands for greatness, glory, and all that is good. If you don't love the flag, you certainly should. F-L-A-G is American symbol land of the free, and that is what our flag means to me. I now would like to read a special pledge to the U.S. This is told to Red Skelton, the King of Clowns, back when he was a young lad in school. His teacher explained what the pledge meant. I, me, an individual, a committee of, committee of one, pledge, dedicate all my worldly goods to give without self-pity, allegiance, my love, and my devotion to the flag, our standard, O oh glory, a symbol of freedom. Wherever she waves, there is respect because your loyal Loyalty has given her a dignity that shouts, freedom is everybody's job, of the United States. That means we have all come together. State of America. <laughs> Something I messed up here. Forty-eight individual communities with pride and dignity and purpose, all divided with imaginary boundaries, yet uh, to a common purpose, and that love that is love for uh, what's that page again? Love for country and to the Republic, a state in which sovereign power is invested in representing representatives chosen by people to govern. And government is people, and is from people to leaders, not from leaders to people, for which it stands. One nation, meaning so blessed by God, indivisible, incapable of being divided, the liberty, which is freedom, the right of power to live one's own life without threats, fear, or some sort of retaliation, and justice, the principle or qualities of dealing, with, dealing fairly with and for all, which means it's as much your country as it is mine. Now, since that time, Two, state, two more states have been added to the Union, that of Hawaii and Alaska. 
and also two words were added by President Eisenhower, the words of under God. Ladies and gentlemen, I now ask that you will stand as we recite the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Bob. If you remain standing, we're going to sing together, God Bless America, it'll be on the screen. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet Home. Remain standing as we sing the Stars Spangled Banner. <laughs> oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. All the rampants we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does the stars bangle banner yet wave o'er the land of the and the home of the brave. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace. May the heaven rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto in God is a trust and the stars bangled banner in triumph shall wave for the land and of the free and the home of the brave praise the Lord you may be seated Right now, I'd like to sing for you a song that means a lot 
to me, and I'm sure it means a lot to you. It's entitled, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. Now we're going to have a puppet skit by my wife and granny. Now my wife has many puppets and I can tell you they all tell me, listen to me. <laughs> Even my pillow tells me, listen to me. So I think she's got something to do with that. <laughs> but 
Ellie and Granny are going to do a skit entitled, If. Ellie? Well, Granny, today we're going to be talking about two great big words. What are they, my dear? Well, the first one is temptation. Do you know what temptation is? Oh, yes. I know. Something you can't use. As I'm concerned, that's Grandpa. He's really hot stuff. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I, <coughs> I don't think that was the kind of temptation I was thinking about. I was thinking about how temptation is a someone who tries to make something go wrong. Well, give me an example, dear. Well, I want to introduce the other big word before we get uh, a little further. The, the other word is the word if. <coughs> what? What? What do you think I am, my dear? Some kind of dummy? If is not a very large word. Oh, that, that's very true. Uh, if is small in size, but its meaning can be very big sometimes. In what way? Well, you'll find out when I tell you the story in uh, Luke chapter 4. This story takes place when the Holy Spirit told Jesus to go into the wilderness and to stay there for a while. And he stayed there for 40 days. Oh, the poor dear. If I had been there, then... It's not working? <laughs> okay. Excuse me for just a minute. There's a little technical difficulty here. <laughs> Will you hurry up? I don't have all day. <laughs> uh, are, are you all set? Yeah, I am now, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, uh, let's see. We were talking about how Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 whole days without anything to eat. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, my dear, that uh, if I was there, I would have made him a big pot of my chicken noodle soup. Well, I know you would have done that, but you weren't there, and he was very tired, very weak, very hungry, and that's when the devil arrived. That old sidewinder, he's always causing trouble. <laughs> yes, he is. He told or asked Jesus three questions, and they all began with that big word, if. Two times he's, he asked, if you are the Son of God, and the third time he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And now, remember, I told you, if is a little size word, but its meaning is very large. And in these questions that the devil was asking Jesus, it questioned Jesus' deity, his authority, and his power. WDJD. What? WDJD. What are you talking about? WDJD, my dear. What did Jesus do? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, every time the, the, the devil asked a question, Jesus hit him with his secret weapon. Jesus had a secret weapon? That's right. Was it a bazooka? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, machine gun. No, Granny. Uh, uh, a cluster bomb? No. Oh, well, how about some knitting needles? Knitting needles? That's what I use when somebody bothers me. <laughs> I can see where that would be very penetrating. <laughs> but no, he didn't use any of those things. Whenever the devil used the word if, Jesus used the word of God. What? You mean his secret weapon was a Bible verse? Absolutely, that's right. And uh, did it work? Every time. And after a while, the devil realized he couldn't get Jesus to do anything wrong, so he left him. 
wow, that is really something. It, it really is. And, uh, using a title to defeat the devil doesn't sound too hard. In fact, it sounds rather easy. Well, I think we better step back a little bit and see maybe it wasn't as easy as you think. So let's go back and see what Jesus did. First of all, he knew the word of God. He had it in his heart and in his mind. He memorized it. Have you memorized some of the Bible? Well, some of the things like uh, uh, Jesus wept and stuff like that. <laughs> well, I don't know how edifying that is, <laughs> but he knew the word of God. And secondly, he believed the word of God. He knew that the word of God was his father's words. And so he believed them. And then thirdly, he uh, obeyed the word of God. He did what his father said in, in his word. And so did, have you memorized the word? Not a lot. Have you <coughs> believed the word of God? Sometimes. And have you obeyed the, obeyed the word? Well, not as much as I should. You see, Granny, you're a perfect example of a lot of believers these days. They say they know the word because they read the word. They say they believe the word because it's God's word. But the question is, are they obeying the word of God? That's the important thing. And that's why we have to make sure we're doing those three things. So let me get this straight, dear. If, did you notice I used that big word? Yes, I noticed. If I... Uh, know the word, and if I believe the word, and if I obey the word, I can stand strong whenever the devil tries to tempt me to do something wrong. Absolutely true. Well, I think I've got to go home and sharpen my knitting needles. Why do you want to sharpen your knitting needles? Just in case that old devil needs a little bit more push, <coughs> push to get lost instead of the ho little Bible verse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Granny is a, quite a lady. <laughs> Would you stand? We're going to be dealing with the subject of a coming storm. You will see the scriptures on the screen and I'll be reading them for you. The coming storm. God promised the prophet Zechariah that in the last days he would be a protective wall of fire around his people. For I saith, for I saith the Lord, will be unto her, unto her a wall of fire around me. Then from Isaiah 25, verse 14. Likewise, Isaiah testified, For thou hast been a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Isaiah 4, verse 6. There shall be a tabernacle for a shade in the daytime, from the heat and a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. Then Amos 8, 11. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Psalm 107, 28 through 31. Yet when they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, the Lord brought them out of their distress. He calmed the storm and its waves quieted down. So they rejoiced that the waves became quiet and he led them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his gracious love and for his awesome deeds 
on behalf of mankind. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we ask you, Lord God, to reveal to us your truth today. We are not here to exercise a religious philosophy, but the word of the living God. Tune us into the word and may the word give us knowledge and understanding and direction in life. In Jesus Christ's name and for the glory of God we pray, amen. You may be seated. The coming storm. Now the coming storm comes right after the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, I want to read to you verses 13 to the end. This is one of the portions that deals with the rapture of the church just before the seven-year tribulation. But I would not have you to be ignorant or uninformed, brethren, concerning them which have died, that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who have died in Jesus, will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, the word of God is being twisted nowadays into saying there is no rapture. Understand that the rapture is Jesus coming to the clouds and drawing the dead in Christ first and then we which are alive to the clouds. The second coming is Jesus coming with us to this earth to establish his thousand-year kingdom. So there is a difference, and it is amazing that some of the evangelicals do not believe in the rapture of the church. They will when they're caught up. You can be very sure of that because the word of God is truth. Now, the coming of Jesus Christ in the final coming my friends, that is something that was known in the Old Testament. They expected that day to come. Paul says, I'm going to tell you something that they didn't expect. I'm going to unveil a mystery to you. Before the coming of the church with Christ, he's got to catch him up to be with him in heaven for those seven years of tribulation. We're going to a marriage feast, and we're going to be married to Jesus Christ. That is the word of the living God. So this coming storm is in that tribulation period, and it's very clear there's going to be a famine for the word, and so God is going to send 144 Jewish prophets to give out the word. And many will be saved in that time. Isaiah prophesies that God will one day rise up and shake the whole earth. It's going to happen. It has not been shaken like it's going to be shaken. The prophet says in Isaiah 24, 1, 11, and 13, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. It's going to be a real traumatic situation he goes on and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof all joy is darkened all joy is darkened the mirth of the land is gone 
the joy of the land, the laughter of the land is no more. When thus it shall be in the midst of the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree. He is comparing the earth being shaken by Almighty God during this period of time to an olive tree being shaken. Please note number one on the screen. God is going to shake the earth as if it were an olive tree till every bit of fruit falls. God is going to do something that has never been done on this earth before. He's going to shake this earth so that the inhabitants are filled with terror. Now this may be an earthquake. I don't know. It may be several earthquakes. I don't know, but I know what God has said in his word as a prophecy. He says this, for the windows from on high are opened and the fountains of the earth do shake. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro off its axis and shall be removed like a cottage. Now this is not talking about something that is just a little bit of movement. It's talking of God in his anger dealing with unrighteousness. Remember, the church has been caught up. It's in heaven. The church is experiencing the wedding feast. The church is having a great, great time. Now on the earth, there's a great shaking taking place, according to the word of God. And other prophets concur with Isaiah's prophecy. Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 38, 20, through 23 these words all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence God will make them shake at his presence now they will know there is a God there is a God that is angry because they have rejected his son there is a God that is full of anger and it's an awful thing says the scriptures to fall into the hands of an angry God. Thank God I don't have that future. I'm in the hands of a loving God because I receive Christ as my Savior. The unrighteous at this time who continue to reject Christ are going to be in a great tribulation. It goes on to say this, they will shake at his presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground and I will be known in the eyes of many nations for they shall know that I am the Lord. You know, right now, many people poo-poo their being a God. They say, we are our own God. And we can run our own life. We don't have to have that old-fashioned religion that teaches that there is one God and he's the father of Jesus Christ, the son of God. We don't have to listen to that foolishness, people going to church and listening to that kind of garbage. We are our own people. And one day God says they will know they were wrong. They will know they were wrong. You know, it's awfully easy to say things when you're ignorant. And when you're ignorant of God's word, it's worse. Joel says in the book of Joel, th the third chapter, the 16th verse, these words, the Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Many people think, well, Israel's going to be destroyed. In fact, they want the, the ungodly want to drive them into the sea. They want to bomb them out of existence. And I can tell you this, it can't be done for God fights for the Jewish people 
They are his special people, but so are we who have been engrafted into the, the vine of God. We are spiritual Jews according to Paul's wonderful revelations. And that means that God is for us and he's for them. Nothing will happen that God does not allow and does not condone. Haggai the prophet talks about this same thing. It isn't just a passing statement about this coming storm. In the word of God, Haggai, the second chapter, verses 6 to 7, we read these words. This is what the Lord God Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the earth and the heavens the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill the house with glory, says the Lord God Almighty. He says there's going to be a time of judgment and there's going to be a time of blessing and it's all based upon what have you done with Jesus Christ. What have you done with the Son of God? The word of God is very clear on this. Yet once more I will shake the earth. Once more I will shake it until I'm through shaking it. When God shakes the earth, a whole lot of shaking is going on. And that's like that song. Now note number two on the screen. God is going to shake everything in sight so that he alone is revealed as the only unshakable power. Many tell me in the places where there are earthquakes like California, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing when the ground is shaking and the buildings are shaking. Everything is shaking. That is instituted by eruptions in the earth. But God says there's coming a day when I'm going to do the shaking. We've got a great, big, wonderful God and a powerful God. He flung out the universes. God calls the stars by name. Think of that. I can't even remember people's name nowadays. I'm getting older, and, and sometimes I have to say, yes, that's great. <laughs> because I don't remember their name. Then it comes to me later on in the night. It's an amazing thing to grow old and have these things not work as well as they used to. But God doesn't have that problem. He calls you by name. He calls me by name. God is interested in us personally, but he's interested in his creation. And mankind has sought and sought and sought for Anyone else that was created by God that's out there that might want us visiting them, and they found none. Because this is a unique creation of Almighty God. The Word of God makes it then clear God is going to shake. When the Lord says, I'm going to shake the earth one more time, He means it. Take Him seriously. Now, as I said to you, if you've received Christ as your Savior, you'll be in heaven. You'll not know this is going on. You're going to have a wonderful seven years. But on earth, they're not going to have a wonderful seven years. So says the word of the living God. Note number three on the screen. He will literally shake our economy. We had it shaken once, but it bounced back. We've got a great economy now, but many people think it's going to last. It isn't. It isn't. There'll come a time when God will shake it to its very foundation. He's going to shake our educational system, and he's going to also shake our government, and I think he's doing it right now. He's shaking the government, and the government isn't what it used to be in any regard to our forefathers' desires. He puts, we put our trust and confidence in everything, and it seems safe and secure, but it's going to be shaken. Don't put your confidence in your Social Security. It will be shaken. 
Don't put your confidence in a doctor. Thank God for doctors. But they will be shaken. They'll say, I don't know how to deal with this problem. We've had so many people go to doctors and they say, uh, we don't know what your problem is. I go to a doctor and the doctor says to me every time, what are you here for? And he's the one that made the appointment. And I say, I think to myself, what am I here for? But the reality is this. God knows every step he wants you and I to take. He knows all about us. We can't go to God and tell God anything because God knows it before we even say it. Could you ever have imagined the greatest nation, the greatest nation, and I believe this, on the earth, closed down because of partisism in government? We can't get anything done because there are two sides and the two sides don't want to compromise with each other. They fight each other. I think we ought to throw the whole thing out and start over again because that's the only way we're going to get anything done in America. Put in people who are there for the people, not for their own interests. We have a great deal of shaking going on on the earth. It's a prelude to what's going to happen. Number four, if you will, the Bible also warns that simultaneously to God's shaking, a great demonic flood is descending upon humankind. A great demonic flood. If you don't think the demons are active today, Jesus believed in demons because he cast them out. The apostles believed in demons because they had to deal with them. There are demons, fallen angels, that want to destroy everything God has created. So you have demons giving doctrines about homosexuality. It's just another way of living. God says, I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because it's not just another way to live. It's an abortery. It's evil in every respect. It's not what I created mankind for. And then abortion. I didn't create uh, a mother to have a child and to kill that child in the wound or wait until the child's out of the wound and then decide whether you want to kill it or not. Abortion is not of God. God had a plan for every one of those children. And God is in laughing at what mankind is doing to destroy, to destroy human life. You think of it, friends. It was awful to have the Holocaust, Jews being killed all over the place. We have reached a pinnacle when there are more people being aborted and there are, there are people, there are people. God said before, my mother even knew me. He had a plan for my life. I was not in the forethought of God, I mean in the last thought of God when I uh, was born or when I was a seed in my mother. I was known by God before I was created, says the word of God. So you're killing, these people are killing God's creatures. And they are God's creatures. And they're the highest form he ever created, mankind. May God forgive America for killing and aborting children and then there is a loads of immorality in the world. The gay pride movement is immorality. It's all immorality. Murder uh, for the sake of uh, your religion. And some religions do that. They just murder individuals that don't agree with them. That, my friends, is immorality. 911 and what happened there to kill so many innocent people was caused by immorality. We live in a world that is demon-possessed, and we, the church, must stand for the righteousness of God and not compromise in any respect. The devil has already brought about a fierce downpour of filth and wickedness. Go on the Internet. All you have to do is put in little women, and you want the book. And you don't get little women from the book. You get pornography. It's so easy to fall into that. 
so easy to fall into that. And they say many pastors have succumbed to pornography, and that's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. When the storm comes, when everything begins to spin out of control, the Word of God says, how many will stand for the cause of Christ? How many will stand for the cause of Christ? You know, churches in America are being emptied because they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are certain churches in the Bible Belt that are filled with people, but in most of New Hampshire, there's very few churches that are packed with people simply because they don't want to hear the old-fashioned word of God, the eternal word of God. How many will have the foundations of faith necessary to endure during these days? In Matthew 7, Jesus gives the parable of the builders. Listen to the parable of the builders in Matthew 7, 24 to 27. And you will understand why many though of those that have followed Jesus have departed from the faith. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, said Jesus, and puts them into practice is a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rains come down, and the streams rose, and the wind blew against it. It blew against it, and the house did not fall because it was founded on the rock. But look at verse 6. This is the all, what the Almighty says. Everyone who builds their house upon the sand the storms will come, the rain will come, and there'll be a mighty crash. In other words, what he is saying is this. There, is though, there are those who are building their house upon the word of God. They're building their life upon the word of God. They're not compromising the word of God. They're not saying, I believe this and I don't believe that. They believe the whole word of God. It is all from God's throne. And they're trying to live according to the word of God. And then there are those who just don't read their Bibles. They don't build their life upon the word of God. They have received Christ, they say, but they're not living according to the word of God. And the same storms come. Life is filled with storms. There are storms that destroy the person that builds their life upon the sand. But those who build themselves or their life upon the rock, which is Jesus, Jesus is the rock. The rains come, the storms come, and they stand. They stand. There are people across our world today in many countries that are being tormented, even crucified, in every way they're being in tribulation because they have received Christ as their Savior. But they're not falling. Rather, they're picking death instead of life if it means rejecting Jesus Christ. The story is told, and it's a true story, about a church and that church was worshiping God and they were serving God and they all proclaimed Jesus as their Savior. And a group of people came that hated Christianity into that church. And they demanded that everyone come out and spit on the Bible. And everyone came out and spit on the Bible except one girl, one young girl. One young girl would not spit on the Bible, and they killed her. All the rest... We're building on the sand. Oh, they were Christians, at least they said so. I don't know. God only knows. They were Christians as far as they said, but they were building on sand, not on the word of God, not on Jesus Christ. She entered heaven, I know, with applause because she was building on Jesus. 
There are many, many, many Christians in Iraq, Iran, China. They're clamping down on Christianity in China. Every place that denies Jesus Christ and hates Jesus Christ and espouses a false religion is saying, you must convert or die, and many are choosing death. And they're martyrs, as far as I understand from Revelation, under the throne of God, saying, how long will you not revenge us? And God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and there'll come a day. There'll come a day when that vengeance comes about. God is saying to us, you build on the wrong thing, and you'll end up denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Note number six. The house Jesus is talking about here is our walk with him. Our walk with him. We are building a foundation of getting to know Christ, of understanding him and his ways. Do you know Christ? As I talk with you on YouTube or the public access, do you know Christ? I know that you may have said I received Christ, but do you know him? Are you building upon the rock of God's word? Can you take the storms of life and still come out shining because you're building on somebody that has promised to not leave you, never to forsake you. Do you know him? Do you understand his ways? He says, my ways are not your ways, nor my thoughts your thoughts. So I need to get to know his thoughts, his ways, that I may know him, that I may know him. What are we building on? Who are we building on? What are the characteristics of our life that show we're building on Jesus Christ? We can't understand this parable unless we understand it's a parable about obedience. It's a parable about obedience. Jesus is speaking of a person who has, hears his word and does it. James talks about that. He says, a person that just hears the word and is a forgetful hearer is just not making it. We must not only hear the word of God, but practice the word of God. When God says, read my word, and he does, we must read the word. When he says, pray without ceasing, we must start to pray without ceasing. Constant attitude of prayer. When he says, go out and tell others about me, witness for the cause of Christ, we are got to, we've got to go out and do that. We are not only hearers, but we're doers. Life is short. Time is running out. And we will stand before the Bema seat judgment of Christ to simply give an account for our life since we believed. Have we done what God told us to do? Have we followed his word? Are we truly giving the Father pleasure? Or are we giving him sorrow? He shut himself up, Jesus did, in prayer on mountaintops. You know the stories. In quiet places, often all night he'd pray. That's how come he had power from his Father. When he came down to this earth, he laid aside his glory. He depended on the Father. He is God, and he never wasn't God, but he had to depend on the Father while he was in human flesh. And so he talked with his Father a lot. And by the way, his Father talked with the people about him when he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Is God pleased with us? Are we doing what God has given us to do? His one great prayer was this, Father, what do you want me to do? I want you to go and talk with a woman at a well. You want me to talk with her? And I want you to lead her to the throne of grace, save her soul. 
I want you to go and heal that person that has leprosy. Oh, you don't touch people that have leprosy in that day because they are contagious, people thought. Jesus touched them because the Father said, go touch them. Go touch them. Jesus told the disciples to go by twos and spread the gospel. And they failed. And Jesus said, you didn't go with the right attitude. If they didn't receive me, you, you simply told them off. Go and love them. Go and love them and tell them the story of God's love. People will only know that God loves them if we love them. If we don't love them, how can God be declared as a God of love? He can't because people won't listen. And that attitude is the attitude of a person who has the spirit of Christ, one who builds upon a rock. They become a soul witness or two. They become a, a somebody that desires desperately to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. On the other hand, the person that builds on the sand does not really build on the word of God. They just show that they are a Christian and nobody can tell it if they don't tell them. It's a temporary lifestyle. The person that builds their life on the sand, he reasons that he'll live in that house for five years, so he'll sell it after five years, and he says it will be somebody else's problem. He reasons with the flesh. He reasons with his attitude. He doesn't reason with the word of the Lord. You see, this person doesn't believe there's a storm coming. They don't believe it. They've never got into Revelation. They think, and the devil makes them think this, that Revelation is a hard book to understand. Not in our day. Not in our day. We see Many things that the book of Revelation declares, we see it in inventions today. Someday I'm going to go into that, how that the radio waves were predicted in the book, Word of God, the helicopter is predicted in the Word of God. It's all there. It's all there. But unless I study, I will never know that. And we have so many ways to study the word of the living God. A Christian celebrity once asked Johnny Carson this question. What do you think about eternity? And Johnny Carson said to him, I try not to think about it. Where is Johnny Carson today? If he never received Christ as his Savior, I can tell you where he is. And it's sad. It's sad. Where will you spend eternity? I know where I'm going to spend eternity because I received Christ as my Savior. I keep telling you that because I want you to know it's not me that's going to spend eternity there because I've done something. Jesus did it. And I received it. Tragically, a lot of Christians try to put eternity out of their minds. They simply say, preach us a sermon that doesn't make us uncomfortable. If I preach a sermon that doesn't make people without Christ uncomfortable or Christians living on the edge instead of living fully for Christ, I will quit because that's what God wants to make us uncomfortable when we're not following him and letting him guide us by building on the rock. Number seven, those who build on the sand have never truly known Christ. I didn't say they weren't saved, but they never have truly known Christ. Jesus describes this person in the seventh chapter of Matthew the 21st through the 23rd verses. Listen to what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
That means they say they're Christians. Will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Think about that before I go on to what he said. Not everyone that goes to church is going to heaven. Who's going to heaven, Jesus? The one who does the will of my Father. They're really converted. They're really saved. And they want to do God's will. They're not there for show. They're not there so that everyone will think, well, I'm a pretty good person. I go to church. They're there because they're in love with Jesus Christ and they've received him as their Savior. Listen as it goes on. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? He doesn't dispute that they did that. Whose name are they using? Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Most Christians never use the name of Jesus to drive Satan out. They do, and they're lost. They're not doing it because they're saved. They're doing it because they know the formula works. Listen to this 23rd verse. Jesus says, Then I tell you plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's not Pastor Hahn saying that. That's not some other preacher saying that. That's not some other, other Christian saying that. That's Jesus <coughs> saying that. I never knew you, even though you said you did all of this in my name. And it goes on to say they're cast into outer darkness. They are not saved. They're not saved. These people did not have a divided heart. On the contrary, their heart was never the Lord's. They appeared to be religious. They weren't because they never received Christ as their Savior. Number eight, many works have been done by those who have never been intimate with Christ. There was a young man called Majo many years ago, and he was leading crusades, and many were receiving Christ. They really were receiving Christ as their Savior. When he grew up, he declared this, I never believed all that stuff. And he went into acting. He was acting before he went into acting. You see, the reality is, a person can look saved, smell saved, but not be saved. If you are saved, and if I am saved, it says the Spirit will witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. And I will want to serve him more than I'm able to. I will want to do much more for the kingdom than I have time to do. I I want to live for Christ, and I want to live for Christ with every fiber that's in me. And I have to pull back because not all of it's God's will. Sometimes God says, you do too much, and you'll never be able to do what I want you to do. Do what I have committed you to do, told you to do, and I will be with you. But don't use that as a cop-out not to do what God wants you to do. Many churches, they look at their pastor and they say, and thank God this church doesn't, but they look at their pastor and they say, that's your job, pastor. You're, you're the one that should witness. You're the one that should do a Bible study. Don't you understand? It's the Christian's job. It's all of us. We are a team. All the disciples, we're a team of Jesus. He didn't say, let me do it all, kids. He said, you do it and I'll do it. We'll all do it. We're the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. They cried, Lord, Lord, throughout their lives, coming to him for relief and power for rewards, but they never really knew the Savior. Number nine, the man on the rocks 
or the rock, embraced and joyfully fulfilled the Lord's command. He joyfully embraced and fulfilled the Lord's command. God's word clearly shows us what it takes to build upon a rock. Enoch obeyed God with the sole object of pleasing God. That's what he had. Hebrews 11 verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Oh, I want to please God. I want to please God with my whole life. And when I don't, I ask him, forgive me, forgive me. I, I want to please you. I don't want to please you because I'm worried about what you're going to do to me if I don't. I want to please you because I love you. And why do I love you? Because you first love me. And love begets love. And he loves me. That's what the cross is all about. The love of God. The love of God. Enoch was translated because he pleased God. Number 10. The more you love him, the easier it is to serve and obey him. Fall in love with God. Fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with the Holy Spirit, the three in one. Fall in love with him. I want to fall in love with him more and more every day because I'm going to see him one day. And I don't know when that day is, but I'm going to bow at his feet and say, I love you, Lord. I love you. Are you in love with Jesus? Is your answer yes? Then I have a question for you in closing. How can you go throughout the week without spending time in the Word of God if you do? If you love him, he's written a love letter to you. How could you ever spend a week without getting into that love letter? John 14, 21 says this, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Do you love him? I love him better every day. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we are overjoyed that we're not going to be in that coming storm because we received your Son as our Savior. And Lord, if there's anyone out there that hasn't done that, then the coming storm could come in a fraction of a second, in the twinkling of an eye as the church is raptured and they're left behind. Father, if there's anyone that goes to church and they have not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. They just like church. Help them to understand that that won't put them into heaven. It'll put them into hell. Without Jesus as their Savior, there is no hope for Jesus Christ to take them to heaven. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you that are watching on television, on the internet, YouTube, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? And do you build your life upon the word of God, the rock? Do you obey it? Do you live for him? Do you love him? And will you serve him? If you can't answer yes to that, the Bible says you're lost. You're lost. You're going to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. God doesn't want you to go to hell. He created hell for the devil and his angels. He didn't create it for you, but you're going to end there. You'll end up there if you don't receive Christ as your Savior. 
Won't you do that right now? Just turn your heart toward God and say this prayer to God in receiving Christ into your life as your Savior. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I now ask you to come into my life, dear Jesus, and be my Savior. I want to know you. I want to experience your love. And I want others to know you too. So make me a soul winner and save my soul. And I pray that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you will take your sheet out that has a hymn on it, and we're going to sing that hymn, My Anchor Holds. Let's stand as we sing. Oh, the angry surges roll on my tempest-driven soul. I am peaceful, for I know, while with all the winds may blow, I'm an anchor safe and sure that shall evermore endure. And it holds my anchor holds Blow your wildest then, O oh gale On my box so small and frail By his grace I shall not fail For my anchor holds My anchor holds Third verse I can feel the anchor fast as I meet each sudden blast and the cable though unseen there's the heavy strain between though the storm I safely ride till the turning of the tide and it holds my anchor holes Blow your wireless then, O oh gale, on my box so small and frail. By his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor holds, my anchor holds. And the fourth, troubles almost round the soul. Grief like billows o'er me roll. Tempters seek to lure us astray. Storms obscure the light of day. But in Christ I can be bold. I've an anchor that shall hold. And my anchor holds. Blow your wireless then, O oh gale, on my box so small and frail. By his grace I shall not fail, for my anchor holds, my anchor holds. We're so glad that you tuned in today to The Bible Speaks. I hope and pray that you've received Christ if you didn't know him when you came and listened to the program. I hope you know him now. And if you did, please write us at The Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire. It's The Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246. God bless you. Until next time. You may be seated.